Up next on Science Goes to the Movies, Louis Black and Brian Greene are going to answer the universal math question, when am I ever going to use this in my life? Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and today we have Professor Brian Green and comedian Lewis Black here on set to talk about math jokes. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you both. In 2013, Simon Singh of The Guardian wrote, without doubt, the most mathematically sophisticated television show in the history of primetime broadcasting is the Simpsons. And why wouldn't it be when five of the comedy writers from The Simpsons have degrees in math or physics from Harvard University? And you probably think the image you're looking at on your screen right now is those very writers posing with their high school math team, but that is in fact our guest Brian Green in his 1977 Stuyvesant High School math team yearbook photo, but it doesn't matter because all math team yearbook pictures have and will forever look exactly the same from now until eternity. Yes? I agree. <laughs> all right, now Lewis, I want to warn you, these, these chairs don't have seat belts, so buckle up because we're going to hit some really hard math puns. You ready? Oh yeah, puns, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I want to remind everyone that since 2009, when it surpassed Gunsmoke, The Simpsons is the longest running American primetime TV series. That said, in the finale of season 26 called Mathlete's Feet, there was a math joke hidden in a frame that looked like this. And the answer was, it was delicious. Our guest, Brian Green, is a professor of mathematics at Columbia University, but it turns out Mr. Black over here has got a few math chops as well, calculus and everything. So I'm going to ask Lewis Black to start on this first. Professor Liu, take it away. Uh, well, as everyone knows, Faith, the square root of negative one is an imaginary number, as we know everybody. I mean, and seriously, everybody. Knows ask anyone that. on the street. Exactly. Uh, which is noted by the symbol I, so this joke starts out uh, saying I. I, right, I. okay, I, yes, um, here, here. A all right, now I'm gonna throw in my 700 math SAT score from 50 years ago and tell you that the second piece of it is, is two to the third power, which is two times two times two, which is eight. So now we have I eight and Professor Green, I will let you take it on home for us and explain what happens next. Man, it feels like explaining a joke is stepping on it, but here we go. So, uh, so sigma, Greek symbol, means sum, add things together, in this case S-U-M, sum, and as those thousands of people certainly know, the last symbol is pi. So if you put it all together, perhaps we say it together. Okay. I, I ate, ate some, some pie. pie. And it was delicious. There you go. Um, Lewis, are you laughing deep down inside? Oh yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, I, I'm not. La I'm seriously not laughing at all. And anybody out there who is laughing, please take a deep breath and and try to find the, a, a, some comedy somewhere in your life. Wait, Other Brian. Had, had we not sit down to dissect this, and you, with your professor of mathematics mind, just breezed by that first the equation with all those symbols, would it have immediately? made sense to you as the setup of a joke? I would have taken a moment and I would have um, smiled deep down inside <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> all right, all right, let's just get... Above the, <laughs> just above your pancreas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right, let's get a little bit deeper. Um, on The Simpsons, like most cartoon characters, almost everyone has only four digits on each hand. However, two characters and only two in The Simpsons universe have all five fingers. Okay, so if either of you can tell me why having only four fingers would, would mess up a character's, you know, mathematics, then I will tell you which two characters got to have five fingers on each hand. Well, it wouldn't necessarily no, mess Raise your it hand, up. please. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll take this one. Uh, yeah, please. Just, just, I'll do it first, yeah. Please. It wouldn't actually mess things up, it would, it would change them. From the base 10 that we're used to, where, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, 10, to base eight. 
And uh, actually, there are some things in the world where it's easier to think in base eight than base ten. So it could it have be been music? an improvement. Is music base eight? Uh, well, anything in which you need to divide things in half. Base 8 is much more natural because when you go from column to column to column in base 8, you're going by factors of 8, which itself is just factors of 2, which means if you want to divide through by 8, you can do that easily by just doing 3 divisions by 2, and we know how to divide things in half. It would have been more intuitive. In fact, it is a tragedy that we have five fingers on each hand and not four. <laughs> Wait, is this the... And in fact, I'll go a little further. Hold on, this seems like you're in high school debate team all of a sudden. I'm sorry, you're you've arguing like, you, you for showed me eight. in high school and it's like bringing it all right, up Right, but, but do you, wait, hither two four. Before this moment, did you really always think it was a tragedy that we're not a base eight society, my Maybe friend? Maybe that was a little bit of hyperbole. <laughs> I got tossed in here. But actually, um, there are civilization societies in which they don't count by the fingers, they count by the spaces between the fingers, and there are four of those. Yes. And they naturally come to base eight just like we would have in this Simpsons reference. Can you, can you give me an example of, so, of such a society? Oh, geez, you could look it up, no doubt. <laughs> Lewis knows the answer yeah, to the this. Mayans. The Mayans. I don't think the Mayans. It was the Mayans. I, don't think, I think the Mayans are base 20, if you Seriously? check this out. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. How many? Yeah. Well, that's what it said in the thing. It said Mayans. Oh, I'm sorry if it says in the yeah, thing. Yeah, if it says in the thing, that's what I'm relying on. <laughs> I have to go with the thing. Yeah, then you're right. Then you're right. <laughs> the, the teleprompter tops the mathematics yeah, professor. Yeah. I think I'm pretty sure Mayans is base 20, but I could be wrong. Well, you know, if wrong. we had a book and we could look in the back of the book or for the answer. If we had answer. Siri. <laughs> Alexis, <laughs> what kind of society had base 20? Yeah. Um, all right, all right. So very good. You get an A for that answer. Oh yes. You know what's interesting though? It, that it, 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 you may know this. I've read this a while back about the Chinese in terms of their math that uh, that they do it. You know that they're they are base ten, but that when they but in terms of their language, it's like they, that the language is such that it's easier for them to to add quicker quickly I rather I than us. That. I see. I see. Yeah, well, I can certainly imagine. You know. I mean, look, adding is not natural. Right? It's something that you have to acquire. Yeah. And if the language allows you to acquire it more efficiently, that's yeah. better. You'll end up with 25,000 emails about this because I don't have the precise answer. <laughs> I do know that 6 plus 7 equals 13. Okay? True. But that's 6 plus 7 equals 13, which is the, what you mean in terms of complication in part. It's, 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 but the, the Chinese have it to a point where it's like it's it's always it's basically ten plus three. It's it, so it's already it's already inherent in the language that the answer is there. All right. Well, don't ask me how. Write in, send letters, <laughs> dude. Please show some love. All right. All right. So everyone breathlessly wanting to know the answer to this question. So to whom on the Simpsons did the creators give ten digits and therefore a natural understanding of base ten decimal calculations? Do you know? Do you know? No, of course not. I, I don't. Who, who pays that much attention to their hands? It's a fascinating answer. Only God and Jesus, uh, who uh. have appeared on The Simpsons. Wow. Which means, I guess, you know, according to the writers, decimal calculations are a gift of the gods wow. in a way. Or, according to every elementary school kid, they have to memorize a multiplication table that's about 56% larger than if it were in base eight. So I don't know how much of a gift every kid will view this as. Interesting. Wow. Wow. I'm glad you weren't my math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been brutal. All right, all right. Base let's, eight, you bastard. <laughs> base eight. <laughs> let's try Let's try this one. Um, by the way, in class, were you always the class clown? Even as a kid? I was the one who knew. I wouldn't call it class clown. There were people, I hung out with who I thought were much funnier than me, but there was, but there were, but what I knew to do was, is when it got too serious in a room, I knew when to pull the string. I knew when to pop a joke. The, when to go, okay, enough's enough. Let's get out of this funk and move into, it, it's basically, and it really isn't being the class clown, it's just giving energy to the room. Um, all right, so this, this next one is from Futurama, season one, episode 11, called Mars University. Um, this diagram is called Witten's Dog, and it has something to do with super duper symmetric string theory. And also, my producer informs me that this is a poop joke. Okay, so Brian, um, who is this Witten person, and does he really have a neutrino pooping dog? Well, Edward Witten at the Institute for Advanced Study is 
widely viewed as the successor to Albert Einstein. I mean, he's probably the smartest person on the planet. He's alive. He's alive. Yeah. He's, have very you met him? Alive. I've worked with him. I've sat in the office with him as we all get very quiet as we watch him think and we don't want to disturb whatever thought oh, process is where happening. Where is he at? Where is he? Uh, in, he Institute for Advanced Studies, so in Princeton, New Jersey. Wow. Yeah. So you, you really, you're like one of the smartest people I've ever met and you go and sit with Miss Professor Witten and just watch him think? Yeah, just so it's clear, if, if like most of us are here, Ed is up here. I mean, there's no... How? How do you know? How do you because know? Because I've, I've watched him look at problems that I had no insight into, and he just, in the privacy of his own brain, solves it and works it out. It's amazing. Wow. Can he work uh, in, with the federal government, maybe, for an hour? <laughs> <laughs> There's some math problem. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what is going, when you look at this image, is, is, is that real math there? And is there really something that's, well, probably not super duper. Is there super? Well, there's a thing called super string theory, and that diagram is a scattering amplitude of strings that are coming together uh, in terms of the whole neutrino quality of this. I'll, you know, I mean, uh, neutrinos are these, these little tiny chargeless particles, about a trillion of them just pass through your body and yours and mine as well. They're all around us, so uh, it's not surprising that perhaps you'd have a neutrino in this diagram. What is neutrino? It's an elementary constituent of, of the world that uh, surprisingly has tiny wispy mass, has no electric charge, which means it can pass through trillions of miles of matter without being scattered. It just passes through it as if it's not there. So it is. Atom, I'm, 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 atoms, molecules, and now it's... Well, neutrinos are not part of that sequence. They're not? Because they are a constituent of reality that doesn't participate in making atoms that make up you and I, but yet they are produced by interactions like things that happen in the sun. The sun is spewing out a bath of neutrinos and those are the neutrinos that are passing through us all the time. So we all do in fact pass neutrinos. I mean it <laughs> yeah, is universal I, 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 poop in a way, yeah, right? Yeah, I'll let you say that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Happy to say it. I have no <laughs> dignity. Um, so, so the Simpsons and Futurama are kind of like math kids passing notes to each other from across the world in, yeah, in, in these kind so. of jokes, yeah? Little inside jokes, yeah, that's what it is. And, and they can do that because an equation is like a sentence, is that right? Yeah, so a well-formulated mathematical sentence, that's what these symbols mean. Yeah, but in, if, if, I, if I have a sentence uh, and I screw up a verb tense, uh, in the sentence, it still it makes some sense. You can follow it. It's, it's, it. Those who've been watching me talk now have a sense of my never getting certainly things right. But you make one little mistake in an equation, and the bastards throw the whole thing out. Now, why can't math recognize minor errors, errors and, and just get on with it? And well, because we have formulated this language to speak about the world with utter precision. So the flexibility that you're talking about, that's what allows us to speak in flowery terms and emotional terms about, about life in the world using ordinary English. But when it comes to mathematical sentences, there's meant to be no interpretation. There's meant to be a specific and precise meaning so that we can get on with the job of figuring out what these equations are telling us. And it's that inflexibility that you're responding to. It feels unnatural, but it's powerful. So there is nothing that is the equivalent of like an adverb or an adjective in math. No, there is, but it's not mm. open to interpretation. So if two mathematicians or physicists look at a mathematical sentence, they both interpret it in exactly the same way. Whereas if I take an English sentence, you two may see colors of interpretation based on your own state of mind or your own history. We want to eliminate that human side that allows us to talk about the world in an objective, precise way. That's what the language of mathematics is all about. Well, that's, what's interesting about that is the language also, uh, because we, we all speak, you know, the way in which you inflect on a word yes. changes it too. You can't inflect on you know, X to the third power or whatever. X to the third power. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I did, uh, I liked math in school, but, um, <clears throat> but in the end, who cares really why the train that's leaving from Albany traveling at light speed goes for five seconds and then explodes? I mean, uh, I, see, what I don't understand is, 
that there is something that I was really good at math. Yeah. I mean, really good and could do all sorts of these calculations. And I had no idea why I was doing them, none whatsoever. And yet I know from the way uh, I hear you talk about it and I've heard other f folks who've dealt with math talk about that. And, and you know, when I watch a TED talk, right. you know, you, they kind of, there is something magical that's happening in there. And for some reason, the, you know, teachers from time and memoriam have not been able to get that across. It's just kind of like, give me the, give me the answer. So yeah. no yeah. one explained to you how it applied to your life, not even though all. you were great at it. Yeah, yeah but you're, what you're pointing out is, is the tragedy of education, because within these mathematical sentences are deep truths about reality, and it's, it's a powerful language to master because you can then make predictions about what happens in the world. I mean, think about what it would have been like a thousand years ago to sit down with a, with a piece of papyrus or whatever and be able to scratch out a calculation that predicts the next solar eclipse, and then it actually happens. That's power. So if a teacher can communicate to a kid like you the power of the insight that comes from understanding this language, it changes the way you interact with these ideas. And, and when I hear stories like that, I, I feel pain. I swear, I feel pain. Well, no, because it's amazing, because it is like, you, can, you, you kind of get, okay, somebody hands you Shakespeare, somebody hands you uh, uh, a novel, somebody hands you, you know, a, a, a movie, you kind of, there's a, stuff going on. The same thing is happening yes. in math. The precise same thing. And, I, and, and it, for some reason, it has always been d d difficult for that expression to get through to folks. And it, and it's, and it is, I, I agree with you, tragic, because it's, yeah. it's... It's not delivered with the excitement and magic that Brian is delivering yeah. now. And it was never explained to me, and, and I, I took calculus too. I, I couldn't even remember, I can't even tell you what it means yeah. now, and I did well, but it was never explained to me as, this is a language. Right, but the, the reason is we so quickly focus in on the details because those are the things that we can test. We're such an assessment-oriented educational system, whereas if we would just luxuriate in the beauty of the ideas for part of the time, we would recognize more broadly that, yes, Shakespeare speaks about life. We all know that intrinsically, right? But math speaks about life too. It just is a different language and opens up the world in different ways. And that's what's missing. And, and yet, in the way that you describe math, m math is the great communicator because no matter what language you speak, everybody agrees on what it says. That's and right. it's saying one thing to everybody. That's right, there's no translation. The amazing, the, 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 but the, the, but what I always found stunning about uh, when I when I finished high school and I was somewhere in college and they're, they're really in just toward the end when I got my first uh, tax form is why, in the name of God, that the one thing that math applies to in our daily lives besides measuring and whatever, right. but the major thing it applies to is taxes. Yeah, and that ah. they don't not once that I know of in the history of any no one I know who went to school. Was, was, okay, now let's apply this practically to this idiotic form that you've been given uh, and, and that you have to fill in the blanks of it. And what do, the, and what do these things mean? Yeah. And it's, it's just extraordinary to me that that's ignored. Right. Yeah, from, from taxes to black holes and the origin of the universe, right? And it's a language that can yeah, really right. cross the whole domain. And the fact that most of us don't have that experience, that's, that's the tragedy. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a deep and serious question kids have been pondering for generations. And when, uh, besides taxes, am I ever going to use uh, the, this stuff in my life? It depends. You know, um, look, my mom has no idea why I do what I do. Right, she still wishes that I had become a doctor. But right? that's you, right? yeah. But that's you know, universal. And yeah, it, that's well, universal, and maybe universal Jewish. It's universal Jewish. <laughs> you guys have the same mom. Yeah, that, that's right. You know. Um, oh yeah, no, they're really they're all connected. <laughs> so, so, so not everyone's going to use math, or even find any of this exciting. But wait, but, not you know. everyone's going to use math. 
not in a way that goes beyond taxes, let's yeah. say. You know, I think in everyday life, of course, you have to encounter the usual symbols that describe the quantitative things that we encounter. But that's not math. That's arithmetic. Math yeah. is oh, insight yeah. into the way the universe works. And that is the side of mathematics that not everybody's going to experience, and that's sad. Is that a Brian Green? Did you just coin a Brian Green saying right there? Is that no? A, I think if you if you talk to most of my colleagues, uh, well, look, the mathematicians go even further. They say reality, pfft, mathematics is its own reality. There are patterns that we're able to ascertain that go beyond anything that's realized in terms of chairs and tables. And that to them is an even bigger reality. I'm very modest. I'm just saying the reality that we encounter can be described mathematically, and that's deep and powerful. Yeah, I'll give you a, 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 an example of that is my father, who was a mechanical engineer and plays video poker, right? And not unlike a, but like nickel, I mean, just a, a, appalling video poker. Well, but, and, but doesn't gamble on, um, you know, the way you should. It's like, you know, if, if there are two kings, etc. you know, you're supposed to keep the He bet he does it all on when he thinks the series are going to be. All of it's based on what he thinks the, the, that reality is. As opposed to probabilities. Right, exactly. Right. He goes completely, goes to the world that you're, the, the math people that you're talking right. about go to. Right. That but, this, is, uh, these, this is what's going to happen in the series. And I've watched him play. And I go, how's he, how's, how's he doing? Is he up? Every so often, I mean, every so often, he's never up, but every, he's playing a nickel, so it doesn't right. even matter. Sure. But we could be playing with matchsticks, that maniac. But what's amazing is, <laughs> is that he'll do something and I'll go, no, it, it, boom, it, it hits. And he goes, see, I told you, it's like, right. Brian, but it's based on that whole idea of probability. Do, do you think that understanding math the way that you do changes the way you, you live in this world? I mean, what is it like to, on a daily basis, what is it like to, to live with such a quantitative understanding? Well, I think all of us, you know, live in the real world in more or less the same way. But I, I would say something that echoes what Richard Feynman, great physicist, once said. He says, look, when I look at a flower, right, some would think that my understanding of physics spoils the experience, that I've taken away the mystery of it. He says, no, when I look at the flower, I can see the red and I can smell the wonderful aroma, but then I can penetrate more deeply. And using mathematics, I can understand how the molecules and atoms combine and yield the color and yield the aroma and where it all came from. So it's a deeper experience of the rose, not a diminished one. That, well, where that, do the neutrinos go? <laughs> they're there all the time. <laughs> Can't you smell them? They're all over the place. Um, um, that reminds me, uh, wasn't it an Einstein quotation where he said, like, either everything's a miracle or nothing's a miracle? That, that his, yeah. his understanding of science made everything miraculous. That's right. And, and I, I totally agree with that. Every time I've studied Einstein's work for 35 years, if not longer, and yet every time I look at it, I find it breathtaking because it's so unexpected, yet so rich, that time doesn't elapse as you think, that space isn't what you think it would be, that there's a potential origin to the universe, that we can use equations to describe the expansion of space. It's breathtaking. Our conversation with Lewis Black and Brian Green just kept getting better and better as it went on, but our show is only about 26 minutes long, and so we decided in editing to share the second half of the conversation with you in the next episode of Science Goes to the Movies. In that next episode, Brian Green and Lewis Black discuss how and when and why math became political. It's an interesting exchange of ideas that we're happy to share with you next time on Science Goes to the Movies. Until then, check out our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook Facebook page for web only clips and to keep up with everything related to science goes to the movies all in one place. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the science tab or try out our new YouTube channel where you'll find lots of science and lots of movies.